Well, today, uh, on this very important day, I want to speak to you on a subject that I believe that God gave to me long ago. In fact, over six months ago, I planned this message. And uh, it's just amazing how God works these things out. Today, I want to talk to you about this topic, the story of the man who did not forgive. Now, we're in this series called Stories, the stories of Jesus, stories from Jesus. And so what we're learning is from the book of Matthew, these different stories that Jesus told. They're called parables, which is, simply means a story. And what Jesus did in these stories was he set up a very, very important truth, something that you and I need to take uh, be aware of. We need to pay attention to. We need to make sure that we're doing what Jesus said. So we're going to begin today in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 21. And then Peter, this was one of Jesus' 12 disciples. Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Let me give you a little background there. In that day, what the Jewish teaching was that you were required to forgive someone who offended you or hurt you three times. And after that, it was Katie bar the door. I mean, whatever you felt like doing, you could do, you could take your revenge. That was the teaching. And so Peter is being super spiritual, he thinks. And he's like going above and beyond, not just twice, but twice plus one. He's like, Jesus, how often should we forgive? And I can see him kind of like putting his thumbs in his suspenders, you know, and like, you know, just chest kind of popping out, being proud of himself. Jesus is going to love me so much. I am so spiritual. He says, how often should we forgive till seven times? And Jesus said, nope, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Uh, Kind of blew Peter's mind. But there's a very, very important point that Jesus was making here. He was not saying after 490 times, then pow, right in the kisser. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, you and I need to practice forgiveness. We need to live a lifestyle of forgiveness and we need to understand the importance of forgiveness and especially as it pertains to our relationship with God. And so then he tells this story. Here he goes. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. Uh, In the process, one of his debtors was brought to him who owed him millions of dollars and he couldn't pay. So his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife and his children and everything he owned to pay the debt. Let me just pause here and just interject this. In some translations, uh, it tells us that this man was the servant of the king and it uses the the term or the amount of 10,000 talents. And the picture here really is that this was not the servant's money, but the king's money, okay? Now, if you wonder how much 10,000 talents are, uh, it is the equivalent of 340 metric tons of silver. It is the equivalent of 200,000 days of work. What you would get paid for a day of work, 200,000 talents of them. Uh, It is the equivalent, listen, of 770 years of service, of work. Now, you might live past retirement age, but I'm going to tell you, you're not going to live 770 years. Now, think about that. If what you owed was everything that you could earn in 770 years, it was the equivalent No matter who you were, no matter how much money you made, it was the equivalent of 25 lifetimes of work. Every penny you would earn in a lifetime times 25. Do you get the point that Jesus was saying this was a debt that this man could not pay? Do you get the idea? The king here representing the heavenly father that we owe him a debt that no matter how much money we have, think about the richest man in the world, Elon Musk, 25 lifetimes of what he has earned in his life. That's an incredible debt that no one, no one can pay. But notice what happened. 
But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. First of all, no, that's impossible. But he was begging for mercy and notice what the king did. He was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. Do you know that's exactly what the heavenly father does for us? When we come to him and admit that we have a debt that we cannot pay, we cannot earn our way to heaven, we cannot earn forgiveness, we cannot do anything to merit God's love, it is purely his grace, and God gives it, and he forgives us, and he pays a debt for us that we cannot pay. So obviously, in this story, you get that this man is a Christian. In other words, he's become a follower of Jesus. He's given his life to Christ. He has been radically changed through faith, right? Everybody get that? But then I want you to know something that even Christians struggle with, because the rest of the story is this. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. And this is probably a poor translation in the New Living Translation, The equivalent of what he owed, and you look it up, what he owed was about 44 bucks. Now think of this, 200,000 years of work. That's what you were just forgiven. And yet you have a friend that owes you 44 bucks. And you understand that in those days, there was no bankruptcy, there were no credit cards. If you owed money and you could not pay it, you were thrown into prison and your family sold or until it was paid, you were indebted. So this guy for 44 bucks, he grabbed uh, him and his fellow servant fell down and uh, he grabbed him by the throat and demanded an instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor, the man that had just been forgiven 200,000 years of debt, wouldn't wait. And he had the man arrested and put into prison until the debt could be paid in full. Now, do you get this picture? We have a debt that has been forgiven us that is impossible for us to pay. And no matter what happens to us, it's like somebody owing us 44 bucks and we were just forgiven hundreds of billions of dollars. Do you know what that tells me? That Christians are capable of not forgiving. Christians are capable of having an unforgiving spirit. In spite of what God has forgiven us, in spite of what he's done for us, we can carry a grudge. We can seek revenge. And what Jesus is teaching here is incredible. And when some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset and they went to the king and told him everything that had happened. And then the king called in the man that he had forgiven and said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? And then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he paid his entire debt. Now, don't misunderstand what Jesus is teaching here. He's not suggesting that if you're a Christian and you have an unforgiving spirit that God's gonna send you to hell. That's not what's being taught here. This idea of being tortured is exactly what we're going to explain in a minute. What happens to a person that does not forgive? They live a tortured existence. They live an imprisoned life. And even though you think that you're being vengeful and getting revenge, you're not actually hurting that other person. You're hurting yourself. Uh, Nelson Mandela is the one that said that Uh, Having an unforgiving spirit is like drinking poison and hoping that it harms your enemy. And and that's what unforgiveness is like. And notice what Jesus said, and this is the big idea that we're going to see. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters. And notice the little words there, from your heart. Now, what does that mean? I'm going to explain it so that you don't misunderstand it. So here's the big big idea. Every Christian must learn to forgive. Every Christian must learn to forgive. Now, I want you to see this. It's, It's a 
a lot in this little statement. Every Christian, that includes you. In other words, uh, Christians, even that have been forgiven, they must learn to forgive. You see, learning to forgive is learned from the Holy Spirit of God. It's learned from the Word of God. It is not learned naturally because our natural way is to respond to hurt in anger and hurt and revenge, right? Either that or we cower in fear. So if you you see someone that's been hurt, they have one or two reactions. They either get angry and they want revenge and they become bitter or they become completely fearful and cowering. It destroys their life. They cannot even function normally because they're afraid or or because they've hurt and they don't know how to operate. It's kind of like in the movie, The Untouchables. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie or not. One of my favorite movies. Sean Connery played a character. He was a Chicago cop. And they were, of course, trying to capture Al Capone. And here's what Sean Connery's character said. You want to get Capone? Here's how you get him. He pulls a knife, you pull a gun. He sends one of yours to the hospital, you send one of his to the morgue. That's the Chicago way. And I would say this, that's the human way. Because the truth is, we want to escalate it. Somebody hurts us, we want them to hurt more. Somebody causes us to suffer, we want them to suffer more. So really, I want to answer just two simple questions today that will help us know what Jesus was talking about and how to do what he said. The first question is, why? Why do we forgive? And the second question is, how? How do we do it? So let's look at the first question. Why do we need to forgive? And the obvious first answer is this, because life is filled with hurts. What Jesus was teaching here, it's kind of obvious. He was saying that everybody's going to have a debt. Everybody's going to have somebody that owes them something. Everybody is going to face harm and hurt and pain. I don't care who you are. The fact is Jesus never promised a believer when they became a believer and a follower of Christ that there would be no harm, no hurt, no need to forgive We all experience that, even in church. Do you know why that is? Because the church is filled up with people. And I know that oftentimes we get this idea in our mind. It's kind of a a romantic idea that, um, you know, the church is filled with angels. The church is filled with people that never do anything bad. And we act shocked when somebody who goes to church does something that causes someone else to be offended. Why should we we be shocked? They're people just like you are. And you know, a lot of people, especially with pastors, they think that pastors wake up every morning at 4 a.m. to the sound of angels' wings flapping, you know, and that God pipes worship music to slowly and gently wake them up as they wake up and they have no hangover from the night before. They have no pain from the night before. They wake up with breath smelling good and ready to meet the day. Well, surprise, surprise. That's not the way I wake up in the morning. And it's especially not the way my wife wakes up. It takes her a long time to wake up. I'm an early riser. She thinks that she's not aware that the sun rises gradually, all right? Because she's, you know, she normally wakes up when the sun is up. And you may be an early morning person uh, or uh, uh, a person like, my wife, that it takes a while and after, you can't talk to anybody it's after your second cup of coffee, and that's okay. But the point is this, you're gonna face problems. You're gonna face hurt. Um, the, the second thing, the reason why we forgive is because God has forgiven us. I've already told you how much in this story, the 10,000 talents, how much that man owed. Now think about this. From a practical application, you and I, Oh, such a ridiculous amount to God, it is impossible for us ever to repay it. And by the way, that man in the story, he got it wrong when he said, be patient with me and I will repay it all. Are you kidding me? How can that be? It's impossible. 
And that is yet the way that many of us approach God. But the point of the story is that the king forgave the debt. Not just that he forgave the debt, but I want you to get this, because it was his money. He received the punishment for that debt. Did you know that in that day that typically for owing money like this, you know what the penalty was? It wasn't just prison, it was death. And the king absorbed the debt. The king absorbed the payment. That's exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. He absorbed the payment for our sin. He absorbed the payment on the cross. He absorbed God's wrath that should have been poured on us. And he forgave us. It's incredible. Um, The Greek word that is used here uh, for forgave is the word apoluo, which means to acquit, to set free, to release, to put away and to pardon. Isn't that exactly what Jesus does for us? He acquits us of our sin. That's called justification. He uh, literally puts it away. He said, I will remember your sin no more. He absorbs our debt. He releases us. He sets us free from the penalty of sin. And what God does for us is that he pardons us. He puts it away. And that's exactly what happens. So we need to forgive because life is filled with hurts, because God has forgiven us. And then maybe this is a very important point because unforgiveness, unforgiveness tortures us. Like I said, there, that man in the story, he was imprisoned and tortured. He didn't go to hell. But when you and I, when we don't forgive, you know what happens to us? We are tortured and imprisoned by the hurt or by the revenge or by the anger. And in fact, that word went when it says that this, um, this servant that did not forgive the guy that owed him 44 bucks, that word it went, it means he searched for him. In other words, you know what that means? It means if somebody's hurt you, it's not just that it's, you know, on your mind or happens to come to your thoughts occasionally. You know what it means? It means that you search it out. You search for opportunities to get them back. You search for opportunities for revenge. And that's what happens when we don't forgive. It literally, people don't realize this. The person that we do not forgive controls your life. They control your thoughts. They control your emotions. Now, once again, I'm not suggesting that All forgiveness is easy. In fact, I'm going to show you how to do this in a minute. And it's certainly true that certain things are harder to forgive than others. If you were abused in a relationship or you were sexually abused as a child, or if a a relative of yours stole your business and uh, you put everything that you had into that and now you're broke, that's a whole lot harder to forgive than to forgive the guy that cut you off in traffic on the way to church, to work in the morning, right? I mean, we all can kind of muster up that forgiveness after we stop cussing and shooting them birds, you know? We're like, oh, okay, God, I forgive that guy, you know? Okay. But it's a lot harder to forgive somebody that's truly hurt you deeply, right? And so what God is showing us is that we have a debt that can only be paid, number one, by God to forgive us, but that can only be paid by forgiving others. It's the only way you'll be truly released. And I want you to notice the ministry of Jesus and what he came for in Luke chapter four, verses 18 and 19. And I want you to notice why, this, these are the words of Jesus. He's quoting from the Old Testament. But he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. poor." You know what Jesus' first ministry was? Salvation. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. So he said, I came to save people. Here's the second thing he said. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Did you know that a part of Jesus' ministry was to mend your heart? To mend your broken heart? And so many of us have had hurts from our past. And not only does Jesus want to save you, he wants to free you from that pain. He wants to mend your heart. And then he says to proclaim liberty to the captives. That means he delivers us. You can be 
imprisoned by unforgiveness or you can be imprisoned by an addiction or or whatever. But Jesus came to deliver us. And he said, in recovery of sight to the blind, he came to enlighten us, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. He came to free us and then to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Did you know that this little phrase, this last phrase that I read, it could be translated and probably should be translated this way. The year of the Lord's favor. Jesus came to pour favor onto your life. Now, I'm not one of these preachers that tries to tell you that there's no problem in life, that uh, if you're really a Christian, if you'll send a thousand bucks into our ministry, God is just going to make you a millionaire, brother. I don't believe that, okay? Now, do I believe that you can't outgive God? Absolutely. Do I believe God blesses you when you give? Absolutely. You cannot read the Bible and deny that. Do I believe that God grows you when you do that? Absolutely. But you know what God says here? Part of what he came to do was to proclaim the acceptable year, the year of the Lord's favor. And you know what I believe? That when you begin to seek God in this way and you release forgiveness, you're going to find the favor of God coming into your life. Your broken heart is going to be mended. You're going to be delivered from the things that hold you back. You are going to find freedom that only comes in Christ. And I don't know about you, but I'd a whole lot rather have that than revenge. I'd a whole lot rather have God's favor on my life. Think about it. What would happen in your life if you forgave? What would happen in your life if you truly believe this and embrace this? It would radically change your life. It would change everything about you. And that brings us to the last thought. How do we do this? Now, Jesus spent a whole lot of time talking about the story. And just one verse, one verse, here's what he said. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters. The key phrase is from your heart. Now, let me tell you what that does not mean. That doesn't mean you have to feel like forgiving the person. I gotta be honest with you. If uh, you had an abusive spouse that beat you and abandoned you and stole money from you, you're not gonna feel like forgiving that person. No way. You don't have to feel like forgiving. And so a lot of people say, well, you know, if I say I'm gonna forgive and I don't feel it, then I'm being a hypocrite. No, you're not. Not according to Jesus. Let me break this down for you. Uh, the, the, the ancient uh, Hebrew way of thinking about the heart, when Jesus said from the heart, it was four things. It was the physical being. It was the spiritual being. It was the emotional being. And it was the mental being. So it's those four things. When you forgave from your heart or you felt something in your heart, he's talking about four areas of your life. Let me just break that down for you, make it really simple. I, I kind of rhymed it so you can remember it. If you want to forgive from the heart, here's what you got to do. Number one, you got to say it. That's the physical part. Say it. Uh, somebody has hurt you. Say it out loud. I forgive you. Say it in a prayer. I forgive you. you say, well, what if I don't feel like forgiving? doesn't matter. Say it. Believe it by faith because when you say it, you're proclaiming it. And you say, well, that person doesn't deserve forgiveness. Of course they don't, but neither do you. And if we want to start being fair and equitable, we say, well, that person doesn't deserve forgiveness. Well, why don't you look in the mirror and say that to God? God, do I deserve forgiveness? Of course not. You say, well, I've been a good person. Yeah. And Jesus said, we all fall tremendously short of God's standard. What is his standard? Perfection. Do you know how many sins it takes to make you imperfect? Just one. You're no longer perfect. And I hate to break it to you, you've never been perfect since you've been born. And so you got to say it. That's the physical response. And then here's the second thing. You have to pray it. You say it. I forgive. You pray it. What does that mean? It means that you spiritually respond and say, God, I don't feel like forgiving that person. And you know what? I believe that we should have more honest prayers. 
because God knows the heart. If you believe that praying to God requires you to speak in Elizabethan English and talk in ways that nobody would understand, our most glorious and gracious Heavenly Father, thou who hast provided for us in our time of need, thou who propagates the Miller family name, I pray in that. No, that, nobody talks like that. When you pray it, it is a spiritual response that says, you know what? God, I don't feel like forgiving that person. That's an honest prayer. In fact, you can say, I, to be honest, I feel like going and burning their house down. All right? I'm just saying, God. And, and it's okay to admit that to God because in case you don't know it, he already knows how you feel. You can't hide it from him. And so, you know, it's okay to admit that to God. God, I, I, don't, I don't feel like forgiving. I don't want to forgive. You say I should, so I'm going to say it. I forgive. I'm praying, God, that you help me to forgive. That is an honest prayer that God will answer. And then the third thing, you obey it. You say it, you pray it, and you obey it. What does that mean? Well, that's the emotional response. You don't have to feel it before you do it. In fact, I would say that the deeper the hurt, the less you are going to feel it before you do it. You say, well, how does that work? Just in the same way with love in the Bible, uh, love, the love of God is a, an action more than a feeling. And the feelings come after the action. And in Hollywood, we say that the feelings become before the action. Because of the way I feel about this person, she makes my heart pump peanut butter, and I just can't hardly, you know, if you've got a pacemaker, every time you pass a garage door, it makes the garage door go up and down when you see her, you know. The fact is, then Hollywood says that that's when loving actions flow. That's not the biblical definition of love. The biblical definition is that I act, and then later I'm going to feel and so in the same way I obey it, the feeling of relief comes after you forgive. It comes afterwards. And not that you're ever going to feel the warm fuzzies about, I read about a family that someone murdered their son. And these are Christian people. And you can imagine the bitterness that they had, the anger they had. And this man was put into prison for life without the possibility of parole. And God dealt with this family's heart and they began to go visit this man. At first, he thought they were there to mock him, but they were not. They were there to forgive him and to get him on the path that he should be on. And God used them. You see, it was not until after they forgave that they began to have a feeling of relief. And then the last thing is this. You repay it. You replay it. You replay it. What does that mean? Uh, that's the mental response and you gotta make a decision. And just like when Jesus said, how often, when Peter said, how often do I forgive? He says, well, till 490 times. You know what the point is? Sometimes it's a process. Sometimes you can forgive and then there's gonna be something that triggers that old sense of bitterness. It's gonna come up into your throat and you're just gonna feel like choking somebody. You know what God says? Just replay it. Do it again. That was number one, God. This is number two. Oh, God, this is number 319. Lord, this is number 450. You know what the point is? Sometimes you gotta do it again. And sometimes you gotta keep on. And you know what that does? It reminds us of how much God has forgiven us. You know, I don't know what you've experienced, but I do know that you've been hurt. And I don't know what you're feeling, but I do know this. I know that you have something that God has brought to your mind. A hurt, somebody that you have bitterness toward. And it can be varying levels. But I promise you, you will only have true freedom until you forgive. And when you forgive, it's like a weight has been lifted off of your shoulders. Kim and I worked with a woman, I won't call her name. Many years ago, we worked with her and she was a wonderful Christian woman. 
she and her husband both were in the ministry, and uh, they were just wonderful people. And um, they, they couldn't have children, at least they thought. And they were just wonderful people that made sacrifices to serve God. And one day, this woman, she went to the grocery store. And while she came out, there was a man in the back seat of her car, held a knife to her throat. He made her drive behind a secluded area and he raped her. You can imagine the devastation. I cannot even begin to understand. And there are people in this room that have been raped. You've been sexually abused. Some of you are abused as children. Somebody, some, there's probably somebody in this room that nobody knows. And you've carried it for so long. And I'll never forget this woman and her husband. You can imagine how angry they were, how devastated they were, how hurt they were. But it was a process. And over time, she forgave. She publicly let it be known that she forgave this man. The man was never caught. He was never brought to justice. And she had to deal with that. Well, she learned this process today. She's much older now. Today, her husband is a pastor of a church. Today, she has an international ministry to women that have been abused, women that have been harmed, women that have been hurt. She, in fact, she started another ministry where she does these missions trips and she takes many of these women have been through what she's been through. They've been raped, they've been harmed, they've been hurt. And she takes them through this process and they go to a foreign field and they minister and God uses them. What am I saying? I don't know what you've been through, but I do believe this. You've been hurt. Maybe not to that level. Maybe you're just mad at God because of something. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to ask God to reveal to you a hurt that you need to forgive. For most of us, it doesn't take very long to think of one. And then what I'm going to ask you to do is this, to pray, God, help me to forgive. And I ask you to heal my broken heart. That little prayer on the screen. Uh, ask God God, help me to forgive, and I ask you to heal my broken heart. Now, if you'll do that, I'm not saying that you're going to leave here and you're going to turn cartwheels and you're going to have, you know, angel dust sprinkle out of heaven over your car. And, uh, but I am saying this, you'll begin this process and God will begin to heal your heart. And here's what I know. Only God can heal only God can heal. But let me tell you, not only is it true that only God can heal, but God can heal anything. It doesn't matter what it is. He can heal anything. And if you'll pray this prayer with me, then I believe that God will answer your prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray for the many in this room that have been hurt. That's everybody, Lord. I pray that you'd reveal to us if there's something in our heart that we need to forgive. Reveal it to us. You just brought something to my mind in my own life, God, that I need to forgive and I need to release. And I release it to you right now and I ask you to forgive and to heal my heart. And I pray for every person in this room, whether someone else hurt them, whether someone else disappointed them, whether it was on purpose or inadvertent, I pray that you'd heal broken hearts and that you'd help us to forgive for it's in Jesus name that I pray and before we finish our prayer I wonder just by show of hands with heads bowed if you don't mind how many would say pastor God brought something to my heart to my mind that I need to forgive would you raise your hand anybody in the room like this be honest God brought something to my heart that I need to forgive thank you how many would say, Pastor, I pray that God would help me to forgive 
that which I, has hurt me. Would you raise your hand? Anybody like that in the room today? A lot of you, okay. And ask God to heal your broken heart. And let this be the first step on a journey of healing. God will do it. I believe it with all my heart. If today you need to receive Christ as your Savior, um, we give you that opportunity online or in the room. Pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you resurrected from the grave. And I ask you to forgive me and to save me and to heal me right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Avalon Church YouTube channel. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision of Avalon Church, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.